It is my great honor and privilege to introduce the keynote speaker of, the, of this year's forum, Mr. Stephen Schwarzman. I first met Steve several years ago at Harvard Business School's Board of Dean's Advisors meeting when we both served on that board. He joined the Tsinghua SEM's advisory board in 2007. Since then, Steve has been very active in engaging the school and the university has been a, and has been a strong and enthusiastic support for the course of the school and the university. Steve Schwarzman is chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the Business Council. He's on the board of New York Public Library and the Asian Society. He also serves on the New York City Partnership Board of Directors. He's a trustee of the Frick Collection in New York City and chairman emeritus of the board of the J. John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Steve holds a BA from Yale University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. He was awarded the Legion of Honor of France in 2007 and was promoted to officer, to officer by President Sarkozy in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Schwarzman to the podium to deliver the keynote speech for the 2012 Tsinghua Management Global Forum. Uh, we have uh, approximately 200 billion of assets under management, but in terms of our number of companies, uh, we own uh, uh, 75 companies with uh, roughly $120 billion in revenue and uh, 700,000 people working uh, at our companies. And we're also one of the largest owners of real estate uh, uh, in, in the world as well. So, so we get to see, we've got 25 offices spread around the world. Uh, so every week when we review what's going on uh, with new potential transactions, uh, as well as what we own, we get a really good feel uh, of, of what's happening. Uh, and to, to think about the global economy, you first have to be thinking about China. Uh, because, uh, as you well know, uh, uh, China, uh, over the last 10 years, has been dragging almost everyone in the world along with them. Uh, it's one of the most impressive uh, performances of any large economy. Uh, in the history uh, of mankind. Uh, and uh, one way to think about a model of the world isn't just China alone, but China is really dragging uh, uh, the emerging markets uh, along with it. Uh, as, as you know from the statistics that, that China has been consuming uh, up to 50%, uh, of certain commodities, and it's created a huge commodity boom uh, in everything from uh, oil to copper to fertilizer. It's an endless list. Uh, and what's happened is if you drew uh, a line uh, from China to its suppliers uh, all around the world, those suppliers uh, have also gone through a complete renaissance uh, uh, in their world. Uh, it's just starting in uh, Latin America. If you go to Colombia, uh, 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 Peru, uh, Chile, uh, Brazil, they're all selling very large amounts of uh, natural resources, whether they're uh, copper or iron ore, uh, uh, to uh, China. And as a result of that, Every one of those countries has gone through a huge boom. Uh, you can see it uh, also uh, in Africa. You can see it through the Middle East in terms of the level of uh, uh, oil prices. As, as you know, just trying to get around Beijing, it's really, uh, uh, really an adventure. Uh, you, you never know when you're going to get any place uh, because there's so many cars, so much traffic. Uh, when I came here in uh, 1990, uh, you almost couldn't find a car. Everybody was on bicycles, uh, and they had roads, but it was sort of a mystery. Why did you need these ring roads? Because there was nobody on them. 
now, of course, uh, it's a complete transformation, and that's been absorbing enormous amounts of, uh, uh, of oil. So countries like Russia have benefited from that. Uh, Norway uh, has benefited from that. Uh, Canada, uh, with all its resources, that it, it also uh, sends to China, uh, benefits uh, from it. And of course, the countries in Asia, uh, from uh, Australia with iron ore and other uh, products to uh, uh, virtually every uh, uh, country uh, is going through a renaissance in large part uh, because of their relationship uh, economically with China and then their middle class developing as a result of the prosperity which then creates a virtuous circle. So what happens with China is not just about China. Uh, it's got implications that if you could imagine a world where China ever went into recession, besides whatever instability it would uh, cause in China, uh, that uh, it would have ripples in these other countries as well. So in terms of the focus, what happens in China is a uh, really uh, exceptionally important element uh, for global growth. And, and China's clearly uh, slowed, uh, as, as has the entire world, uh, if you look at the uh, IMF numbers, I guess it's down to 3.4% uh, globally. Uh, but, but what's happening with China is, is difficult to understand uh, from the outside because it's so big uh, and uh, it's hard to measure. Uh, I guess the numbers are showing that uh, growth in the last quarter is somewhere around 7%, and most people uh, in the country expect a growth rate of uh, uh, seven to eight percent on a long-term basis. Uh, however, uh, on an anecdotal basis, uh, you know, um, it, it's not clear exactly what the growth rate is. Um, it's always hard to measure an economy. Um, I had one friend who's running a very large uh, company, uh, famous worldwide company, who, who told me three weeks ago his uh, revenues in, in China were down uh, 80%. Uh, I talked to somebody else in the chemical business who told me his, his, uh, his revenues have, have really sort of collapsed. Uh, and, and so it's, I talked to somebody who's quite large in the commodities business and said he's feeling uh, the fact that the economy is quite slow. So as an outsider, I, I don't really know uh, what's uh, happening here. Uh, but when you get these anecdotal uh, evidence, um, it, it, it seems to me that you know, when you look at the growth of uh, electricity in China, which was 2%, uh, which is one indicator uh, of, of uh, you know, what the economy might be responding to, it, it's clear that it's soft uh, compared to what it's been. Uh, and there have been some uh, policy uh, responses to that. It's a difficult time in China uh, for planning uh, because when you go through this kind of once every 10 year uh, political uh, shift, uh, uh, a lot of decisions, uh, as you know, uh, don't get made on as timely a basis as they might in normal times when China is an extremely responsive uh, uh, society uh, from a governmental perspective. So I think we have to look at China probably uh, as if it's more or less uh, uh, hit bottom. Uh, there have been some policy responses. Uh, and with the formation of a new government, uh, my uh, instinct uh, is that China is going to get stronger. Uh, and that, that may surprise uh, a number of people uh, around the world. I see the Chinese as being extremely adapt adaptive, uh, uh, smart, clever, willful. Uh, and um, I don't believe uh, that um, the downward trends um, that we've experienced are going to stay that way uh, for very long at all. It's, it's just not in the nature of the culture uh, to allow that to persist. So I can see that increasing. Now, that will also affect those emerging markets, which all of them uh, have uh, slowed down. I was in Colombia. Um, I guess it was three weeks ago, uh, and, and they went uh, down by several percent in terms of their growth, uh, and we can see that happening in virtually all of the emerging markets. Even Brazil had a quarter, second quarter, they had no growth, 
Uh, that, that's sort of an amazing uh, thing. They've lowered their interest rates, they're going to turn around. So I, I see uh, sort of a cyclical upturn coming uh, based on uh, a resurgence um, of, of, of China. Um, won't necessarily occur in the next month, uh, but I think when you're looking out over the next year or two, uh, you'll see that. Uh, Europe is a fascinating place. Uh, uh, it's far away from, from China, but geez, you, you, it, it dominates the news. Uh, and I, I've seldom seen such a mess. Uh, and uh, it's, it's got structural issues. Um, the EU, as you know, has 17 countries uh, that are trying to make uh, uh, policy uh, at the same time. Imagine you have 17 heads of state uh, 17 legislatures, typically with an upper house and a lower house, and, and, and 17 judicial systems, all trying at the same moment uh, to make decisions on a timely basis. There are so many issues uh, that are facing uh, uh, Europe. Uh, uh, the first is that most countries have a uh, pretty bad deficit uh, situation, uh, which needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, uh, they unfortunately uh, have uh, typically weak banking systems. Uh, and uh, it's, it's compounded uh, by, the, by the fact that there was a, uh, a, a, a regulation uh, promulgated in Europe called Basel III. And if you don't know about Basel III, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, Basel III was the response uh, to the Western uh, financial uh, 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 turmoil. And, and basically, the presidents of the uh, uh, heads of state at, at the G20 in Pittsburgh decided that they would make the banking uh, uh, system globally much safer by doubling the amount of capital, uh, doubling the amount of equity. Now, imagine a, a, a sort of a simple mathematical um, problem uh, of this type. Uh, if you want to double your equity capital, uh, how do you do it? Uh, well, one, one way to do it is that you sell more stock uh, and, and issue securities to increase uh, your, uh, uh, your equity. Uh, but, but the problem with doing that is that if people don't trust your financial statements, uh, they, they won't buy the stock. Uh, the second thing is you could cut your dividend uh, a little bit, but it doesn't save much money. Uh, so how do you uh, double uh, your uh, equity? Well, the way you do it mathematically uh, is that you shrink your total assets in half. Uh, now, this sounds like an odd prescription uh, for the world. Uh, can you imagine uh, if you shrunk uh, the size of ICBC in half, uh, what that would do, as well as you, your other large banks in China, somehow you wouldn't be able to grow because nobody could get credit. Uh, because the rule uh, uh, of, of growth is that, that global growth uh, is correlated almost one-to-one -one with credit extension. So what the heads of state did in Pittsburgh is they basically doomed uh, the uh, Western world to either slow growth or no growth uh, by, by voluntarily shrinking its system. Now, they, they, they basically tried to do this uh, by scheduling out uh, the, uh, the timing when, when that had to be done. Because if it happened in one year, it would be uh, 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 very uh, uh, pro-cyclical. Uh, and, and so they basically announced that they would, you, you didn't have to comply until 2018. Uh, but the problem with that is that the markets looked at this, and imagine if you were listening closely and you were in the financial world, and the heads of the central banks announced that the banking system actually uh, wasn't in good shape, it was in terrible shape, and to be safe, you had to double your equity. Well, you know, nobody likes unsafe. Uh, financial institutions, uh, and and what you do is you'd say, well, geez, who's the safest? I, I don't want to wait till 2018 for the weakest institution uh, to be in good shape. Who's the strongest? 
I'll give them my money and I'll deny my money to the weak ones. So what happened is that this whole fossil three plan to wait till 2018 more or less collapsed. Uh, the regulations are still in place, uh, but the markets has rationed capital uh, and has punished uh, it's a lot of the weaker European uh, institutions. Uh, and I, I go on at some length about this because the only way out of the European problem is you can cut your costs, but you have to grow uh, to, to increase your revenue. You just can't keep increasing taxes on your population. Uh, that's not the right way to go. So, so what's happening in Europe now is they're trying to deal with their deficits. They're having enormous difficulty growing. Uh, the Basel III regulations are still more or less uh, uh, intact, and they've got themselves in, in a situation where it's extremely difficult uh, for them to prosper. All of this is around preserving the euro, uh, which is their common currency. Uh, for those of you who don't have a chance to uh, spend time in Europe, and I, I spent six months last year uh, living in, in France, so, which was a very interesting experience. Uh, great country, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, that that um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to understand the commitment to the euro. It's, it's almost uh, a religious commitment uh, for the people involved. It's not an economic concept. It, it means something different uh, to the Europeans, except the British, uh, uh, who opted out of it. But, it's, it's an astonishing uh, commitment. So all of these uh, 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 op-ed writers and other people who talk about the euro, euro collapsing and so forth, it may mathematically have great difficulty, but the commitment of the leadership of these countries to the euro is frankly astonishing. Uh, it's almost not rational. Uh, it is rational for them, but it's, it's something not to be underestimated. So as you look at the uh, uh, trends for the world economy, it, it's, it's very difficult to make the truly positive case uh, for Europe uh, over the next several years, given all the issues of integration uh, that they're going to have to do. Um, uh, and, and they're doing it in a way that's really hard. The Germans, uh, uh, which is the richest country, uh, take the position uh, that they're prepared to support financially the reforms that are necessary in Europe as long as the individual countries uh, reform themselves first. So it's almost like somebody who's prepared to give a guarantee when it's not needed. Uh, because if everybody kept their hand out and said, give me some money, uh, the Germans would have to keep giving it. Uh, and part of making each country more or less stand on its own bottom uh, is, is sort of the sine qua non uh, for Germany, and Mrs. Merkel is quite strong uh, uh, about this. And so each country is going through its own internal difficulties of becoming more competitive, reforming its labor, which is its hard hardest uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be uh, quite some time, uh, many years, as they go through uh, this difficult process. Europe is about 25% of the global economy, uh, and although some countries are quite strong uh, in Northern Europe, uh, it's gonna be difficult uh, for Europe as a whole uh, to, to really grow uh, uh, with any rapidity. That leaves the United States, which is around 23% uh, of the global economy, uh, and what's happening in the States, uh, we're running large deficits, uh, really because we've just not addressed them, which is part of what this election is about. Uh, and we're doing it, uh, that's about 9% uh, uh, deficits, eight and a half to nine. Uh, to explain what's happened with the United States is pretty simple. Uh, over most of the post-World War uh, 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 period, uh, we've run a federal budget uh, that took in about 18% of GDP in taxes. And we spent around 20% uh, uh, in, in programs. What's happened over the last 10 years is, is that we're now spending 25% of GDP instead of 20. 
And uh, in the Bush era, they cut uh, taxes. Uh, so now taxes are only bringing in around 15.5% uh, of GDP in revenue, uh, down from 18. And so the debate that you see or hear in the media uh, is about uh, what should we be doing with taxes uh, and, and what should we be doing with spending. Uh, if you want to get back to where you were, uh, it's pretty simple math. You have to decrease uh, by 5% spending. And a lot of that are what's called entitlements. And once you give somebody something, they hate to give it up. Uh, on the other hand, we can't afford 25% uh, uh, of, of GDP in spending. Uh, and and uh, the tax base has been lowered across the board, not just for wealthy people, it's been lowered for everybody, uh, uh, to 15.5%. And you know, there's a school of thought that uh, says that should be increased to get up to 18. There's another school of thought that you keep it lower. Uh, and, and that creates more growth and more tax revenue comes in. But there's no doubt this has to be uh, dealt with. Uh, we can't keep uh, a $15 trillion economy. We're running deficits of a trillion dollars a year. It's, it's frankly unsustainable. Uh, and we haven't had the leadership uh, in the country uh, to, to address it and force it uh, to be resolved. Uh, and that's what's going to be happening over the next year. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating year uh, in the United States uh, on these types of issues. Uh, and, it's, and it's fascinating because there are a lot of different ways to solve this problem, uh, but you're going to have to do it. At year end, we have something you'll be reading about or hearing about uh, called the fiscal cliff. And, and what this is is a number of pieces of, of legislation automatically expire. Uh, at year end. Uh, the Bush tax cuts expire, so everybody's taxes uh, in the country uh, would, would go up. Uh, uh, temporarily, during the financial crisis, cut the payroll deduction uh, tax in half, and that's supposed to expire at year end. Uh, and we also passed another uh, piece of legislation August a year ago uh, to cut 1.2 a trillion dollars over uh, 10 years out of the budget. So that decreases um, uh, growth um, uh, as well. Simple way to think about it is basically if all these things reverse, uh, it's 4% of uh, GDP taken out of the economy. On an economy that's basically growing at close to two, which means we'd be too negative uh, and we'd go into recession. Uh, and uh, the way you don't go into recession uh, is, is that you do a variety of other reforms along with that and schedule uh, that, uh, uh, those uh, decreases um, uh, over uh, several years. The problem we have is a political one where there's, there's two alternatives of what's going to happen. A, a reasonable person uh, would believe that with the new president, even though it may be the same president or, or it'll be the challenger, uh, and a new Congress that starts, uh, uh, I guess, in the third week uh, in, in January, uh, what would happen is we wait for these new people to get there, and then we do whatever we needed to do to solve our problems. Uh, and that's what's called, uh, we have an expression, I don't know if it uh, translates into Chinese called uh, kicking the can down the road. Uh, and that just delays all problems until the new Congress and the new president can deal with it. There's another a school of thought that says we're not going to do that. And we're just going to let everything become activated. Uh, and we're going to drive, imagine you're in a car and you're driving off of a cliff the fiscal cliff, uh, and we'll, we'll challenge uh, ourselves to go into a recession or get the people in the Congress to actually finally address this problem. Now, it used to be that everyone thought we would just kick the can down the road and then fix it. But apparently more people 
uh, some very influential political people, think, well, maybe we ought to just drive off and put pressure on everybody and come up with a solu solution. Uh, that's got a percentage uh, probability that is no longer low. Uh, it's not over 50%, but it's, it's no longer zero. Uh, and were we to do that, uh, that might have some very complex uh, uh, interactions with markets uh, around the world. It, it might uh, affect confidence uh, in the United States, which could have other uh, implications uh, as you're waiting to solve these problems that frankly uh, require long uh, negotiations uh, to do it. So that's a real overhang. Uh, absent that, we have a relatively slow growing economy uh, that no one in the, the states basically thinks will put us in recession um, uh, because we're going through a period where we're waiting to see what happens. We have enormous liquidity uh, in the United States. The banking system is in uh, excellent shape. Uh, corporations have two and a half trillion dollars uh, of cash doing nothing with it except waiting around to figure out what's going to happen with this election, uh, both with the members of Congress uh, and the President. There is a theory of the case that if we have a change in government uh, and we have a much more pro-business uh, environment, which would be a Romney uh, environment, uh, eliminate a lot of regulations that are planned to be coming in that have uh, questionable utility uh, and uh, unleash a positive spirit uh, in the business community, which has been more or less frustrated uh, over the last four years, uh, solve our deficit issues. You can have uh, increases in GDP. Uh, my own uh, estimate on that would be somewhere between 150 and 200 basis points. And in a country the size of the US, if you bend that curve up on growth at the same time uh, that uh, China uh, is doing the same thing, uh, then we could have a situation where 75% uh, of the world, roughly, is going into a growth mode, uh, which is not what everybody's expecting, but could actually really happen. And it doesn't take that much. It takes the decisions of a relatively small numbers of, of, of people in those two governments to allow that to happen. Uh, so as we look around the world, there's a more gloomy scenario. Uh, I happen uh, to believe if we have the right kind of uh, uh, political changes uh, that uh, uh, we'll actually have the more cheerful uh, scenario. Uh, and it's one uh, that we really uh, uh, need. Uh, just a, a, a final uh, note on transnational management. I'm not actually sure exactly what that means. Uh, you know, it's not a word we typically uh, use uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, English. Um, in, 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 the, in the world you live in, for example, uh, the educational world, there are enormous, enormous changes uh, that are coming your way. Uh, I was at uh, uh, a dinner with uh, Drew Faust, who's the uh, president of uh, Harvard. Uh, I guess it was uh, last uh, Thursday night. Uh, no, it was Tuesday night. Uh, and I was sitting at the table with a number of uh, very well-known professors. And what they were talking about was almost uh, it was really quite fascinating. Um, it was the impact of the internet uh, on uh, education, not just the United States, but globally. And um, uh, when I went to school, we, we, we didn't have videos. Uh, we had a professor in the classroom. Uh, we didn't have iPads or Samsung devices. We, we, we just had somebody talking to us, uh, and, and we took notes. And then at the end of the term, somebody would ask us some questions and we'd give them an answer. Um, that was it. Uh, occasionally, we'd have a smaller class where we talked. 
uh, among ourselves uh, with a professor directing it. And that was education. Education now uh, with videos, uh, and interactive videos, um, and the ability to transfer knowledge from one part of the world to another instantaneously is going to lead to enormous paradigm shifts uh, in education. Uh, one, of, one of the things um, that people were talking about is that I guess it's Harvard, MIT, and, and Stanford uh, who have some of the best uh, educational pedigrees uh, in the world uh, are, are talking about uh, coming together and sharing uh, uh, courses, putting them on the internet, uh, so that everybody in the world, you know, when I was young, going to Harvard, going to Yale, but well, this was like an aspirational goal that was so powerful. It was your passport, education is the passport to a really good life. Um, and and you, you fight like, you know, like heck to, to position yourself to get into a great school like Chenhua uh, or a great school like Yale. It would, it would transform you and you get the educational experience, you, you learn the values and so forth. Well now, uh, pretty soon, you're gonna be able to just like pull it up on your iPad. Uh, and there, there will be this wonderful professor that you've never seen, that you'll never meet, who will give you the Harvard experience. Um, what an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, that, that this will be. And I'm on the board of the New York Public Library, and one of the things people were talking about over the last five to 10 years is the obsolescence of libraries. Who needs them, right? Who needs them? You can get everything you want, uh, you know, on the internet. As it works out, the attendance of the library system has been going up, uh, not down. It's sort of like, the, the uh, problem where the internet is going to completely destroy shopping malls and people still go to them. And, and they don't get the same percentage share uh, that, that they'd uh, uh, be getting without the internet, but they're doing fine, uh, those, those businesses. And the education area, you know, what happened uh, with, with, the, with, the, with, with, with the internet, with education, with the library, is what they're finding is different library systems are combining, like they're putting some stuff on Google together uh, so that the user, uh, instead of just having this one library, has a lot of libraries on a system, it's better for the user. They come into the libraries because they have uh, uh, librarians who are more educators, uh, who can help people, uh, and something's going to happen uh, to um, the educational world. Uh, your children are going to have different types of education uh, because of this. Uh, and there's going to be some type of globalization effect, uh, really for the benefit uh, of everybody in the world, which will also add, just to be crude about it, uh, to growth rates around the world as we educate. And you're fortunate here because you're in Chenwa. But not everybody's at Chenwa. And not everybody goes to college. Uh, but they're going to be able to uh, get a quality of education that's going to raise the standard of living uh, in the world. And that's just one of the many trends uh, in the future that I believe uh, are, are definitely uh, going to happen. So with that as sort of an opener, uh, I think I've been asked to take some questions, so I'm glad to do that if anybody wants to ask them. So my question is, um, unlike the active strategies in the US in the past several years, most of the PE investments in China always actually the product via IPO. However, the stock market in China recent years did not perform well. So do um, you think, um, so it actually seems like PE firms in China need to find other ways to exit um, except IPO. So, in your opinion, what will be the trends of the exit strategies in the next five to ten years in China? Thank you. Uh, I had a little trouble hearing that for whatever the reason. Uh, maybe my ears may be just the amplification. 
you, you were talking about exits yeah, on... Yeah, exit strategies in China for the PE firms. The PE firms in China always exit the project via IPO for right. the past several years. Yes. However, well, yeah, the international trend is not I, like this. I understand the question. Thank you. Um, uh, one of our businesses that we're in is the private equity business. Uh, you know, we're actually in seven different business lines. Uh, uh, you know, private equity, real estate, credit, hedge funds, uh, advisory businesses of different types, and, and also a money raising business. Uh, and, and so what's, what's happened around the world, uh, you know, particularly in China, I realize everybody in China believed that markets only went up. Uh, this, this was like an interesting phenomenon. I gave a, a talk actually at Shenhua uh, in November uh, of uh, 2007, and I, I thought I was going to be arrested because I, I sort of said, I think it's like over. Uh, you know, I, these markets are just much too high. I think stocks are trading at 60 to 70 times earnings back then, and, and uh, things don't stay at 60 to 70 times earnings. It, it happens every once in a while. Uh, uh, those of us who are a little older than most of you uh, call that a bubble. Uh, when you're in a bubble, you're not allowed to tell anybody that you are, apparently. Uh, but uh, I was quite pleased that uh, nobody walked out of the room and nobody said anything nasty. Uh, now you've experienced the other side of that uh, curve, which is as markets go down, the enthusiasm for buying equities goes down. And if you own assets, uh, what do you do? Uh, particularly if you're in a limited life uh, fund. Uh, in China, uh, the classic exit was IPO. Why? Because uh, uh, actually uh, IBOs always went up. Uh, that was more or less the way the markets worked here. They would stimulate them so that you had demand that was 20, 30, 50, 100 times. Uh, so no matter what you bought, it always went up and now that doesn't happen. Uh, so what we find in the private equity business is that at least uh, three ways out uh, of an investment. The first is an IPO and selling all the time, uh, over time, to get rid of your position. Uh, the uh, second is to sell that company to uh, another company, a strategic buyer, uh, or to another private equity firm if they think they can improve the business. Uh, further, in the third way out uh, is to uh, uh, re-leverage the, the business, pay out a dividend, uh, continue to own the business and con continue to earn more money, grow the business, take out another dividend, and wait for a better time. So I think you have to look at, at, at those three to four routes uh, out of an investment. Most important thing in the private equity business is continuing to invest in that company to make it absolutely as good as you can with the fastest growth uh, that you can do. And what you find is that if you have a wonderful company growing very quickly, someone will buy it from you. Next question. Um, my question is also related to private equity business. Um, so private equity industry in China is booming. Last year, $50 billion were raised for private equity investment. What are your recommendations to the private equity industry to make sure that a such amount of capital is deployed in the most economically efficient manner. You, you lost me on that. Somebody can. I, I would like to hear your recommendation to private equity professionals about how they can make sure the capital they deploy is deployed in the most economically efficient manner. That, that money is uh, deployed in the most efficient manner? Yes. Uh, well, we, we have a lot of CEOs on these first two rows here. Uh, and and, and they, they can answer this uh, uh, and, and at least as, as well as, as I can. Uh, um, that what, what we all look at is trying to identify uh, growth areas where we can make the highest returns. Uh, on capital employee. It's sort of a global rule. And, and, and if you do that, um, you, you'll make a lot of money. Uh, and it's just fundamental. 
and I don't think it's any different in private equity than it is in, in regular business. I mean, we're just buying businesses in a different form, typically putting a little more leverage in them. Uh, but but the, the rules of you know intelligent uh, in investment in of capital uh, really don't change much between country to country. Uh, the rules change, but not the fundamental analysis. Are, are people lined up there, or are they are the gentleman in the white jacket, or? My name is Jean Bo. Uh, uh, my question is, I have a foolish question, a small question. As we all know, currently, the world, world, world over the past seven years, beginning from 2008, uh, the world economy and the central political system are undergoing fundamental transformation never seen over the past several hundred years. We see far-reaching dynamic or turbulence, burst economic, finance, and political. Could you explain or comment a few words about this kind of new phenomenon from the perspective of exact science, and that is complex system dynamics? Thank you. Well, I think. Uh uh, the, the, the world's uh, accelerating change. And it's an accelerating change uh, because of uh, uh, globalization uh, as well as um, uh, communications. Uh, and we're seeing that um, everywhere. Uh, if you just take markets uh, for a moment, um, it used to be uh, when I joined the business, I, I know you find this uh, almost like like uh, an observation from the Middle Ages. That, that when I, I joined the business, there were no uh, databases. Uh, and when we had to do a financial analysis, we would go to the basement of our building. I worked at Lehman Brothers, a blessed memory. Uh, and go down, they had newspapers from 100 years. And you would go and you would open the newspaper to do an analysis, uh, and uh, you'd go to the end of the month and, and look at the stock in the newspaper and you'd write down what that would be. Uh, and you'd, you'd come home at night, you know, covered with newsprint, uh, and your wife, you know, would say, well, what did you do? And you so I was in the basement looking through newspapers. Uh, and, and now, that analysis can be done by just hitting uh, one key, uh, and you get all those answers um, like that. And that shows you just one odd example uh, of, of what's happened uh, with productivity, white collar productivity, um, over over 40 years, uh, and um, we're finding that that's happening everywhere. Um, uh, as a result of uh, uh, the electronics, and it's happening in markets uh, as well. So, so for example, because there was no connectivity uh, around the world, something that could be happening in China could have absolutely no impact in the markets uh, in New York or in London. Uh, it would take a long time for anything would uh, uh, to be known to other people. There were huge discontinuities. Uh, and, and in fact, our job as corporate finance people was basically getting market information and calling uh, a company and informing them of what was going on with the markets. Not much value added uh, unless you didn't know what was happening. Now what's happening is that with with the internet connecting everyone in the world, when there's a piece of information, 
everybody gets it instantaneously. So what's happened as a result is that instead of the normal circuit breakers that you have on markets, which come from the fact that different people just didn't have the information and they could make different bets, is that now it's like being on a boat and everybody gets the same piece of information at the same moment. So if somebody says there's a fire on one side of the boat, everybody will run to the other side. And then they say, oh my goodness, there was a mistake. It's on the other side, and people go over. And if everybody's running to one side of a boat, that boat is going to really start tipping. And that's the world we have today. That world where everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, and it's creating enormous difficulties uh, for the control of markets. Uh, it, it's also creating this globalization, is, is creating real difficulties. China has been the net winner uh, in globalization. Uh, from the base where you started, uh, the work ethic, uh, the cost of labor, uh, you know, good policies, uh, has created an enormous uh, increase in uh, wealth uh, in the country. But, but not everyone has benefited in the same way. In the West, uh, where jobs were lost, uh, revenue to the governments has been uh, uh, impacted, and it's created a variety of, of, of difficulties. So we, we've got some real challenges uh, in the modern world uh, that we have to work our way through. Uh, and, and this question you asked of what's, what's the model, what's the change, uh, I think uh, we're all um, uh, struggling uh, with that bit. Uh, it's, it, there's no instant answer except wealth globally uh, has, has gone up. Uh, uh, but, but there have been real winners and losers uh, uh, in, in, in that uh, uh, arena. I don't know when we're supposed to end or not end. Tell me whatever you like. Sir? Uh, Mr. Shurkin, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, that's my dog. Not loud enough? Yeah, better. Right. yeah. Um, so you've spoken a lot about the global macro factors facing you know, Australia, South America, and also the Penn this whole clip. But uh, this is the obligatory student question, right? So for a graduate going into this environment, what is the opportunity? What are the areas of growth that we could potentially look at from either an uh, investment or industry standpoint? Thanks. You know, um, uh, the um, the, the areas of, uh, of opportunity for individuals and countries are, 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 are different. Um, I, I think just some simple uh, advice. If you find something that's very heavily regulated, stay away from it. Um, uh, some of the greatest uh, problems have been created uh, in those industries by uh, the combination of both managers and regulators. Uh, you know, for example, in the in the West, uh, almost the only companies that collapsed were regulated ones. I don't know what that says, uh, but it doesn't say something good uh, for, for regulation as a concept, or if not as a concept, and, and in terms of its application. Uh, I, I, th I think um, there are a variety of industries that are terrific. Uh, uh, the whole technology area uh, is, is, is almost like magic. Uh, where uh, you, you can, you know, and, 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 and technology cycles in terms of the type of, of uh, 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 products that are of interest from, from hardware to software. Uh, the, the whole social media uh, area, for example, I mean, you spend a few million dollars and, and, and you can create Google, um, or not just Google, there's a whole array uh, of companies uh, that have been uh, created. Now, usually what happens is by the time somebody like me can comment on, on it, it's already yesterday's news. Uh, and there's some other uh, area in, in, in that kind of field. Uh, I think also energy is like really interesting. 
uh, the, the world's uh, got enormous needs for energy. It's got needs for clean energy, uh, and um, uh, as well as uh, you know, fossil fuel energy. Uh, and if the world's going to keep growing, even if the growth rate's going to be a little slower uh, over the next uh, 10 years, um, it's, it's, it's an immense uh, uh, area. Uh, uh, another uh, opportunity, is, as I go around uh, the world, is that uh, there are a number of very rich countries that are suffering uh, and are desperate to get people who are experienced in management, who are willing to live in those countries. Uh, and uh, there is very good, uh, good opportunities for personal development uh, and wealth creation. Uh, if you're willing uh, to, to go to places somebody might not go to, uh, where you've had some experience uh, as, as a manager, uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity that's just sitting there. It, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, in, in a really unattractive place either. Uh, it's just a different place. Uh, so I think those are, you know, I, I can go on for a long time about areas that I think will um, will, will do well. For some reason, that mic's not as loud as that one. So I don't know why. Well, that's better. So. Uh, hello, Mr. Swartman. I'm an undergraduate student at School of Economics and Management. Uh, you presented us a quite huge blueprint of the global economy, but I want to ask something more specific uh, connected with education. You, know, uh, you must have heard of uh, the story of connecting dots mentioned by Steve Jobs. So, uh, did you learn something that seemed quite, maybe quite useless at that time, but turned out very meaningful? or to generalize it, what, what is your opinion of general education, especially for students like me, who choose to major in economics or finance? Uh, education is really interesting type of thing. Uh, if you're not educated, uh, you can still make a living, but you've got to be enormously clever. Uh, and it, it's happened. You know, great fortunes have been made by people who are not uh, well educated. Uh, but, but, but education itself is just one step on the road uh, to uh, uh, success. Uh, and it's, it's useful to study something that might have uh, direct, direct application. Uh, but it's actually uh, uh, extremely important uh, to, to go to a place that encourages uh, education uh, in the future. In other words, in, in our business, it's, it's a lifetime education. I'm still learning. Every time we make a decision, it's challenging. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of complexity, uh, and, and uh, you, you, you don't declare victory when you get a diploma. That, that's, that's not victory. That's victory that you managed to graduate, but but it's not um, uh, it, it's not an end in itself, uh, and it's really about uh, discipline, uh, energy, uh, understanding what people are saying, uh, and meaning not just what they say, uh, and it's a commitment uh, uh, to working really hard. People who become successful, it tends not to be an accident. Um, it, it's, it's, it's about a lifetime of good habits and looking at opportunities for yourself. Uh, and, and so what you study, ironically, uh, and this is more of a Western uh, view than perhaps a Chinese view, uh, what, what you study isn't as important as how well you do. Uh, because if you get an interesting job uh, and you learn from that and you try something else, uh, eventually you will find your way. And one other piece of advice I'd give you is do something you love. Uh, if you don't do something you, you, you love, then it's work. If you do something uh, you love, it's like amusement. Uh, and you work much better when you're amused than when somebody's telling you to work. 
And, and again, that may be a Western uh, concept, and if, it's, if it doesn't work for you, you can always start your own business and amuse yourself. Um, final question, I think. Somebody um, told me, me uh, I think we were next, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, my name is Shelley Carabell, and I'm from the NCI Business School. We're an educational partner of Tsinghua. In fact, our executive master's program was just ranked number four by the Financial Times. Um, this is a question for our knowledge portal. I I'm curious to, to know what you meant. After you had some disappointing second quarter earnings, and you said that, that you would have to continue to innovate ways to add value, that these were tough times for alternative asset managers. I wonder what it is you're actually doing innovating ways to, to add value. And I ask because of your uh, your real estate fund that closed at a record 13 something billion dollars. I'm wondering if that's part of the innovation. Can you just elaborate on how you're innovating? Uh, the, the question was about innovation. Uh, and uh, what what we, we've been doing to innovate at uh, Blackstone, but I think it was meant as a more general uh, uh, question. Um, the, the businesses that don't innovate um, typically are declining, although the people running them may not understand that. Um, when I was working at Lehman Brothers, I realized that uh, this was the good Lehman Brothers, not the bad Lehman Brothers. Uh, that that. 80% of our products uh, became functionally obsolete uh, in five years. In, in other words, there was no margin left in them. So what we were in, in finance, because nothing's patentable, there's some nice people sitting in the first two rows who have the advantage of some rewards that they get patents and they're protected and they can charge and they can have mini monopolies. And, in finance, virtually nothing is patentable. And if you invent something, uh, there are all these smart people who copy you almost instantaneously, so you're in, under constant pressure uh, to be innovative. If, if you don't understand that that's your job, you won't have a job uh, eventually. And, and so what, what we are looking for in every one of our businesses is, is some way to bring a new service uh, to, uh, to customers who happen to be uh, large institutional uh, investors. Uh, we're looking for trends that other people don't see, um, uh, or if they see, they're just not ability to marshal the organizational strength to offer uh, new things. Uh, and that's just part of a good uh, culture um, and, and, and starting new things is fun. Uh, I, I love starting new things. Uh, and you only start new things if you think they have big potential. Uh, and what happens when you do that uh, is that then your own people are excited because younger people get a chance to run something else. And it's a virtuous uh, circle. It's good for clients. Uh, it's, it's good for the, for the firm, it's good for the younger people to get experience. Uh, and uh, innovation in finance is, is absolutely um, non-optional. And once you teach everybody at the firm that, that that's the only way, then they look for those discontinuities where they could start something uh, that's good. So I think, I think I'm getting uh, the hook, that's what we normally call it. Thank you.